Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, also known as the SciStarter Podcast. In this episode, a summer sensory extravaganza, the beauty and complexity of flashing fireflies, the sounds of periodical cicadas, the sensation of sun and waves on your skin. It's June, and the fireflies are just starting to appear, including here in the greater Washington, D.C. area. This is some poor-quality phone video I shot last night of a couple of Photinus fireflies, probably Photinus paralis, the big dipper fireflies that make the little J shapes in the air. They also produce toxic chemicals called lucibufagens that repel birds and spiders. And you might be thinking, wait, lucibufagens? Bufa means toad. So are these chemicals the same as the bufadienolids that some toads make that cause cardiac arrest? To which I would say, yes, they're very similar. And I might add, dang, you really know your naturally occurring polycyclic compounds. That's really impressive. Now, another firefly, Photurus, can't produce that chemical. So they are tasty, and so are their offspring. They would be eaten by birds and bugs. But female Photurus fireflies imitate the Photinus flash pattern to attract Photinus males, saying, hey, big bug, come on over. But when the Photinus males approach, looking for a good time, the female Photurus eats them. I know, that was unexpected, right? And, but that way they absorb the anti-spider chemical so she won't be eaten. And then she passes it down to her offspring so they're safe. So this is either a touching story of maternal devotion or a horrific tale of insecticidal treachery, depending on your perspective and on whether it's told in a horror film or a Disney isn't nature wonderful circle of life kind of thing. Anyway, that's just one of the zillion crazy Firefly facts you would learn by joining Firefly Atlas and becoming a contributor and hanging out with Firefly researchers like Roshan Vigneraja. Roshan is an esteemed Firefly expert, currently conducting research into the distribution of several rare species in the Mid-Atlantic region of the U.S. He's also just 14 years old. Hey, Roshan, thanks for uh, joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. So um, I'm really interested in, in, your, um, in, in your interest in fireflies. And uh, can you tell me when you first started, um, you know, sort of becoming interested in them? Well, fireflies, I started becoming interested in them, I'd say about three or four years back. And my first major thing was looking for Photurus bethaniensis, which is a critically endangered species of firefly in Maryland. And I think a lot of people um, just think there's fireflies. They don't realize that there are lots of different kinds. So yeah. uh, talk about that a little bit. I'd say there's there's about four genera of fireflies that we find in, in the mm -hmm. East. Um, Photurus, Photinus, Pyractamina, and Phausus. Phausus is found in the mountains. It has a blue glow, very rare. Um, pyractamina is found pretty much everywhere with an orange glow. Um, Photinus, which is the one most people see, the Big Dipper mm -hmm. fireflies, which the flash goes like that, um, kind of like a J, and those guys are pretty much everywhere. And then Photurus is the genus with the most diversity, and they have a green flash most of the time. And they, depending on the species, their habitat differs. Wow. And in a, in a regular backyard, like a suburban backyard, um, is there any diversity there? Or are they yeah, all just the Big Dipper ones? Mostly the Big Dipper ones, obviously. But you'll also have Photurus hebes. You'd have um, Photurus, or Photinus macdermati. You might have Photinus sabulosus. Uh, it all depends. You might have um, Pennsylvanica. Futurus Pennsylvanica. Mm -hmm. Just depends. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people are um, sort of interested in having habitat to preserve, you know, like pollinators or monarch butterflies or things like that, and focus on on you know those sorts of organisms. Um, are there things people can do to to encourage fireflies? Absolutely, plant native plants, um, especially grasses, native grasses, which are often overlooked. 
Hmm. Because your fireflies are going to be eating slugs and snails and worms. And they need moist areas. And grass needs to be covering up those moist areas as larvae. Great. Well, that's good. Anything else uh, uh, you want to add? Well, there's really aren't that many people looking for fireflies. So I do encourage people to go out looking for them and submit their data to either Firefly Watch or also the Xerxes one. I think it's called Firefly Atlas. Oh, okay. And iNaturalist. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Roshan. Thank you. Now, while fireflies communicate through light, many other summer creatures rely on sound, few more so than the ear-splittingly loud periodical cicadas. There are seven species, they're all in the genus Magicicada, and they're found only in eastern North America. They live as larvae underground for either 13 or 17 years, which are prime numbers, and then they emerge in large, regional, really noisy broods. There are 12 broods of the 17-year cicadas and three of the 13-year cicadas. And this year, as you may have heard, there are two broods emerging in adjacent territories. Brood 19, known as the Great Southern Brood, that's the largest of all. It goes from um, Missouri and Arkansas and Southern Illinois all the way east to North Carolina, um, south to Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, and then there's brood 13, which is kind of concentrated just in eastern Iowa, northern Illinois, and um, southern Michigan. Now, it's really rare for two broods to emerge in adjacent territories at the same time. In fact, these two co-emerged most recently when Thomas Jefferson was U.S. president 221 years ago. So if you are going to be anywhere near this swath of country, consider joining Cicada Safari and downloading the Cicada Safari app. It was created by Gene Kritsky at Mount St. Joseph University in Cincinnati. And uh, scientists like Gene not only want to map the emergence of the cicadas, but also want to study the areas where they overlap to see if there's any interbreeding between the broods, which could lead to some interesting genetics and mathematics. And while cicada safari is just for periodical cicadas, Regular old annual cicadas occur almost everywhere on Earth. And if you want to report on them, just go to iNaturalist and search for cicada. There are close to 100 projects covering cicadas all over the world. Also, check out Cicada Mania, a web page uh, with all things cicada related. But now, Let's leave the world of bug sights and sounds for the enveloping sensation of the ocean. Surfers are literally immersed in their elements. The salty ocean, the crisp breezes of the seashore, and they have their own way of communing with nature and also with citizen science that's important to them. At SciStarter, there are two large citizen science projects created by surfers, but open to anyone who loves coastal environments and wants to protect them. One is Surfrider, an organization created 40 years ago by surfers in Malibu trying to protect a local surfing spot. Over time, they grew into a national organization with chapters in surfing hubs all over the U.S. In citizen science circles, they might be best known for their Blue Water Task Force, which empowers non-scientists to conduct water quality testing through 50 chapter-based labs. The work dovetails with that of local government agencies to quickly detect and remediate contamination of beaches. If you want to get involved, visit SciStarter and search Surfrider to find your nearest chapter. Another surfer-led program is Save the Waves. Surfer and oceanographer Diego Sancho Gallegos is conservation program manager for Save the Waves. It's an international nonprofit dedicated to protecting what he terms surf ecosystems. So a surf ecosystem, obviously there's the wave, but it's also the plants and animals that surround that wave and the human communities that rely on that wave for their livelihoods, well-being and cultural significance. Um, so it's kind of like an interdisciplinary approach that we're taking to conservation, using surfing as the, the vehicle for conservation. The key to the program is public involvement, not just surfers, but anyone who cares about coastal environments. The main way that uh, people can engage, like the easiest way to engage with Save the Waves is through the Save the Waves app. 
So it's available for Android and iOS. Um, it's in four languages, uh, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. Um, and it works anywhere in the world. So it's a, it's a tool that allows individuals to make reports around coastal threats that they find in their you know beaches, coastlines, um, communities. So the idea is that we connect all the threats or as many of the threats as we can with our local partners on the ground that are actively working to solve these issues. So it's a, it's a tool for you know people like you and me to get involved and um, help support these different projects and programs to do coastal conservation in their um, local community. The app gives you six different types of threat to choose from, plus a seventh general category that you can just fill in. So you take a photo of the issue, you write a short description and submit it, and the app automatically geotags the report. And that goes into our database which is also publicly available for anyone who would like to look at it. Um, you can see the map on our website, uh, savethewaves.org slash app, or you can also um, you know, do a data request through our, also through our website and then you know, process the data, map it out, um, whatever. You know, if, if people have like, uh, interest in exploring the data more in depth, he says they're currently creating a fellowship program to support people in locations where threats have been identified so that they can follow up. The support might include training on advocacy, uh, fundraising, or science-based remediation. Whatever can help them work locally to address the situation. Check out Save the Waves at SciStarter to learn more. Finally, modern technology has allowed us to extend our senses beyond what we see, hear, and feel in our immediate surroundings. The Catalina Sky Survey Telescope lets us sense Earth's greater surroundings, keeping an eye out for near-Earth asteroids. Some of these asteroids stray perilously close to Earth, threatening fireflies, cicadas, surfers, and well, everything else. And as we all know, the best way to avoid a catastrophic asteroid collision is to know when one is coming as soon as possible so we can try to deflect it. That's why University of Arizona planetary scientist Carson Foles and his colleagues created Daily Minor Planet, a project that relies on thousands of sharp-eyed volunteers, just like you, to check over daily sky reports looking for any unexpected visitors. We upload new images every day, and what we're asking people to do is exactly what we do when we're up at our telescopes. We take four images of the same spot in the sky, and we look for tiny objects that might be moving. Background stars, background galaxies are all stationary, but the asteroids move around just a little bit. And we need your help to identify those in our images. It's a small team and they have a lot of sky to cover each night. And we only have so much time during the night to review our images uh, before we have to move to the next one. But we generate so many candidate detections that we need help going through the rest of them. Otherwise, the potential asteroids that, is in that, that are in that data would just never be measured, and they might be missed. And while most of those objects don't pose any threat to Earth, it's still important to keep a watchful eye. The dinosaurs didn't have a near-Earth object survey program, and it didn't end up well for them. Now, there's currently no giant asteroids that are threatening the Earth but we still want to find even smaller ones that might impact the Earth many years in the future. We want to find them in time to do something about it, which we currently have the ability to do. Uh, asteroid impacts are probably the only natural disaster that we might have any say in preventing. Again, the project is called the Daily Minor Planet. It's on the Zooniverse platform, but you should still sign up through SciStarter to keep all your citizen science activities right on your SciStarter dashboard. Well, that wraps it up for this episode. I'm Bob Hershon. Thanks. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, which is jam-packed with citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot org. If you've listened this far, you are our kind of people. So thanks for at least considering being a citizen scientist, getting involved and making a difference. And if you have any ideas you want to share with us, any things you want to hear on this podcast, get in touch with us, please, at info at SciStarter.org. We would love to hear from you. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.